to bore you too much, basically. And um, one of the things I am going to be sort of talking up, talking about really and touching upon um, is the idea of sort of chaos and embracing chaos. Um, I did have a slight panic before when I realised that this slideshow wasn't running as well as it perhaps could be. Um, and then I thought, well, that's quite nice because it kind of mirrors, you know, one of the subtexts to the presentation. So I'll just warn you now, it may not run smoothly. Um, but yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, global collaborations, funnily enough. Um, a lot of people have been talking about that today as well. In fact, when I looked at the programme, I must admit I was quite nervous because it's one thing talking about doing interesting things um, in a university context, but actually when you start you know, looking at what's going on in kind of secondary and, spe and especially primary education, I think that's where the really good stuff's happening in kind of teaching and learning. So I hope it's not going to be a case of teaching your grandmother to uh, suck eggs. Um, but yeah, I'm going to talk about, um, a, I'm basically going to trace the evolution of um, a project or rather a, a community that I've been involved with for a few years now. Um, and it's the, an evolution from a community of mobile filmmakers and um, moving from global projects to a global community that hopefully inspires people to collaborate. And it's quite a subtle but quite a significant shift. Every step of the way, there have been things that have been mistakes we've made, things that we've done well, things that we haven't done so well. Um, and it's always a case of real sort of lessons learned. And I never think you have the answers, do you, as an educator? You know, we are constantly learning, we're constantly testing things, trying things, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. So I'm basically going to tell you the story. Um, of that today. So firstly, why mobile film? Okay, I've been um, involved in mobile filmmaking for quite a few years now. Um, the thing that kind of drew me to it, I guess, was um, the my teaching and my research is based on digital identities, digital literacies, and digital cultures. So for me, the mobile phone is a kind of ubiquitous media production device that we, most people have in their pockets, um, is quite compelling. You know, we realise our identities through the media we create, through what we choose to share about ourselves. There are specific cultural practices embedded in the use of these tools. Um, and obviously, you know, the digital literacies demanding of us in order to kind of participate in online spaces. So I find it really attractive for that reason. Um, I'm also attracted to mobile filmmaking because I'm actually based in computing science and engineering where I work with um, acoustics, acoustic scientists and video engineering students and for many years I've noticed that with um, the video engineering students they're really good at using high-end cameras um, but the actual narratives and the thinking behind the films they produced wasn't that good, they were so focused on the tech. So at that time, this is kind of pre-HD cameras and smartphones, the aesthetic was characterised by being kind of shaky and grainy and pixelated, basically looked a bit rubbish. What it did do was it forced people to really think about the content. You can't get away with telling a poor story when things don't look very good either. So there's lots of reasons for me getting into that space. Also, everything I do is around the web and digital cultures. So I'm really focused on short form content, creating compelling web content. Okay, And again, mobiles lend themselves brilliantly to that. So that's kind of my driver. Um, but yeah, I think the, you know, the, mobile, the mobile device um, is kind of fascinating in terms of its in-betweenness. You know, it's something that's in-between photography, film, the personal computer, internet, GPS. It takes us into very new spaces in terms of the way that we produce and consume um, media. Um, so we've got these new forms of production and consumption. Um, and then all sorts of things like the, the new ways with which we might make films now. There's lots of crowdsourcing. We just saw a fantastic example then. You know, everybody contributes a small bit to a final production, and crowdsourcing is huge, and that's a real big part of digital culture in a network society. Micro formats fascinate me. Vine, six seconds. Instagram video, 15 seconds. Last year, we saw the first Instagram TV show, so imagine that. Every episode is 15 seconds long. Um, so, you know, it really challenges our perceptions, you know, why should things be distributed in 30 minutes or one hour slots or two hour slots at a big movie theatre. These are all traditional modes of production run by the gatekeepers and now it's this kind of real free-for-all space. So I think it's really exciting to kind of um, explore that space. Um, the drive to share is huge as well. You know, we don't just, we don't take photos or make films to be kind of shown in a theatre or in a photo album anymore. 
when we use these devices, we're kind of we're sharing something intimate about ourselves, our lived experience. It's almost like a prosthetic camera in a sense. Um, we're able to, you know, we've got this audience in mind. We're sharing instantly with our friends. I'll just show you a quick example here. Um, this is my first time in Ireland, so I was really excited last night. <laughs> when this happened, um, I hope it was amazing. Uh, Mary, we've known each other online for quite a few years now. We met for the first time face to face. Mary treated me to my first pint of Irish Guinness in Ireland. It was amazing. And then the crisps were the crisps, and I was genuinely so excited about this. I was like, it feels impossibly exotic. Yeah, so <laughs> straight away, I'm not Instagramming this. Um, you know, in terms of this drive to share, not only am I wanting to share this experience, you know, with my friends um, on Instagram, but um, just to sort of think about, you know, the networked cultures that we're living in now and the kind of, you know, the blurring of boundaries between online and offline and everything. Um, when I finish here, I'm actually going to Dublin and meeting two ex students who saw this photo on Instagram and said, one of them said, oh, are you in Dublin? And he's just like, wow. And one of those students actually taught him, it was um, one of the first digital identity blogging projects I did in kind of 2008, and it was all very kind of new to me then. And so it's really weird to think that, you know, we were able to sustain these connections and that the, the image acts as this trigger. So there's so much for me to absolutely love about image creation and sharing through mobile media. And I think for all learners, no matter what discipline they're from, it's it, you know it's very valuable for people to learn that kind of how to really operate within these new spaces. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, more Guinness and crisps with the ex students <laughs> later on tonight. But anyway, um, other exciting developments: proliferation of apps. You know something really um, interesting that happened last year was uh, one of the uh, an Oscar winning winning film, a documentary, Searching for Sugar Man, was completed using a one pound forty nine app. Now, the reason being is because lots of the film was shot on 8mm uh, film and the director ran out of money, wanted to finish the film and used an app, which the 8mm retrapped. So that's kind of a landmark moment. And um, so what we're seeing now is that even though, you know, mobile film does challenge traditional production practices, it used to be seen as a very kind of weird, avant-garde, pixelated thing. As cameras have improved, we've got the proliferation of apps and we're getting kind of, you know, famous photographers winning competitions with a photo they've shot using Hipstamatic. The two spaces are really, really blending, and I think that's a very exciting place for us um, to be. So that's probably, I will stop evangelizing about why I love mobile film now. I'm sorry, I do absolutely adore it. Um, it's a really experimental space. So, um, I was lucky enough to meet some like-minded people through the power of the interwebs in about 2010, and this is the team that I've been working with since then. So we've got Dan from New Zealand, Laurent from France, Tom from New Zealand, that's me, Philippe from Colombia, and Max from Germany. And uh, we all are into mobile learning and mobile film. We're all coming at it from very different angles. Um, but we kind of started talking, we liked one another's ideas, we were very interested in one another's practice. So in 2010, we became kind of like critical friends for one another's classes. So, you know, I'd, I'd, I mean, I'd stay up and do kind of the odd guest lecture for New Zealand from 2am to 4am on a Monday morning, which was delightful. Um, yeah, so it did not knock your body clock out a bit. But essentially that developed and um, it all kind of worked really well. And so we thought, well, why don't we get our students co-creating, you know, collaborating and really using these network located devices to their full potential. Let's get them collaborating across space and time on the production of mobile phone films. So um, the project is called ELWIS, which stands for Entertainment Lab for the Very Small Screen. And in 2012, um, our, our ultimate goal was to develop new ways of kind of seeing and learning and collaboration through mobile phone filmmaking across disciplines and across levels. So quite kind of lofty aims in that respect. But we wanted people, we wanted our learners to learn from one another's disciplinary perspectives. You know, mine are kind of much more engineering focused. Dan's students are from cinematic arts. Laurent's students are graphic design students. They all have, you know, very different sort of sensibilities and aesthetics and ideas about what's right and what's wrong. And that's quite interesting to throw um, different disciplines into kind of one project, one space in that respect. But it was also about us modeling a kind of paradigm shift in educational practice. So the um, goal for Elvis 2012 
was um, to get uh, our students working in international teams to create films on the topic of sustainability. So the project was called um, Mobile In, Global Out, and it involved students in New Zealand, France and the UK. Kind of similar student numbers, which we split into groups of, I think it was maybe nine students, four teams. So I'll just show you the website now. And this is where, um, this is where everything will probably fall over, because there seems to be some issue with resolution. So let's see what happens now. Hopefully it won't go too long. Let's see, we just open your browser. You're running commentary. Here we go, let's see what happens. Is it gonna work? Oh, oh, oh. What's happening? I told you there was something amiss. Here we go. Right, still having a little thing. Hey. I just want to show you this quickly, really, to give you an idea of the kind of organisation that went into that. So we had about 50 students in that project. This is now an archive because the project's over. Um, if we go to, well, I'll just show you down here the site map, and it shows you how kind of complicated that whole thing was. Um, I mean, we've got feed, our feedback on there, learner blogs and reflections, all the links to the different teams and their collaborative spaces, their different blogs, their Google Docs. Um, assessment briefs, what it is, how it works, research outputs, um, loads and loads of stuff on here. Um, let's see, let's have a look at the timeline. Just trying to give you an idea. The first thing we do is say hello. Everyone makes a hello video. There we go, we've got little hello videos down there. Um, some more info for the students here. Here's a master project timeline here. Each country. Showing there, what project, what we're doing, when. So there's a lot of organisation going into this. Um, lots of suggestions for the learners. There we go. Different projects, we've got those on there. You've got the dates, so when it was launched in the different countries. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of kind of instructions on here. It becomes quite kind of unwieldy, unwieldy in a sense. So we'll look at what's in this one. Can't remember now. Yeah, okay, so it kind of goes on and on and on. So that was how it was organized. So we thought, you know, we'll we'll just use open spaces, we'll put we use Google, Google Docs, Google Hangouts, the blog, everything will be open. We had a YouTube account. We gave every student the um, username and password for the YouTube account, you know, ultimate trust there. Anyone could have gone in and caused trouble. Nobody did. It was a really, really nice project. You know, we're very pleased with the way that, um, that it went overall. Um, one of the things that was really important for us there was, you know, Google Hangouts. We kicked off with having a great global hangout, which should appear in a minute now. So we had about 50 students meeting, um, and I think it was about 8 p.m. for us. So for us and the French students, all my students, our students had beers, and the students in New Zealand had croissants, and it was a nice bit of sort of you know, cultural to and fro in there. So they all met one another that way. Um, we, and then the students started in their teams having their own hangouts. That was really interesting to see the way they kind of approached those. Um, and then we started merging the two groups, so students would join tutor hangouts and vice versa. All of our planning documents in Google we made available for the students to see, so they could see us developing the curriculum. It was very, very open, and it was a great project. Um, things worked well in many ways. You know, we had manageable numbers, balanced teams, and we could easily kind of monitor and manage and sort of control things. That was fine. What didn't work so well? The films themselves. Okay, after a few years of us all working with students to make these wonderful experimental mobile phone films, and um, please don't tweet this, but I've never seen so many boring pieces <laughs> of time. <laughs> they put so much effort into just the logistics of collaboration that it had taken away, you know, the sort of creativity, the energy for experimentation. So that was quite sobering for us, really. I mean, it was interesting to see that, that actually the group that really followed things to the letter and did everything according to the timetable when it should have been done, came up with the, most, the dullest film ever. Actually, the team that spent all of their time flirting with one another in a Google Hangout until it got to four days before the deadline, when they were, oh, blimey, we've not made a film yet. 
Um, theirs was actually brilliant because it had soul, it had love, it had personality. So, you know, the parents' socialisation was really crucial there. But as I say, it was, um, it was quite sobering for us to see how dull our students' films have become when we trust international collaboration on them. So we thought, well, we want to do this again next year, but what can we do to really try and push them to be more kind of out there, experimental, you know, really explore the devices again? Um, so the following year, we stumbled across um, this, which was an opera, State of Being. So State of Being was a crowd, it was a crowdsourced libretto, and the opera was being premiered um, at an opera festival in London last August. And so um, the project for 2013 was for 120 students this time from around the world, and we've included Colombia into the mix. We had Colombia, France, New Zealand, UK, to create the visual backdrop for an eight-act opera um, sh entirely shot and edited on mobile phones. So we went really kind of right brain on this one. Each group was given an act, and all they had for each act was a one-word descriptor. Okay, science, love, truth, drugs, sex, jazz. And then they were given the soundtrack. Now it's about as avant-garde as you could possibly get. There were no tunes in that soundtrack at all. So, you know, we were really kind of pushing them into a very uncomfortable space, thinking, oh, look, this is good, this will challenge them. Um, I'll just show you quickly the organisational chart for State of Being. Um, hopefully it's the one. As I say, it was much bigger this time. So, just to give you an idea of the kind of chaos, um, here is the structure. One opera, eight acts, eight teams, three groups within each team. Team conveners, blogmeisters, compliance curators, scribes, blog feeders, group conveners. And here are the teams in the groups, for each project, love, dance, science, music, sex, drugs, death, truth. I mean, this was complicated. And these students had to negotiate multiple time zones. When you start adding Columbia into the mix, it's not as simple as being 12 or 13 hours apart anymore. You've literally got a short window every day when everybody's kind of awake and available. So some interesting things happened there. Not many, not many hangouts went particularly well, seemingly. Um, but, you know, the, the end result, um, it was... It was really, it worked in the end, it did work. And it was premiered down in London. The full performance is actually available um, online. And there's a gorgeous little two minute promo that some of the students went down um, and did for that. But it's one of those things where when you tell people about this project, you go, oh, it was this eight act opera, students from all around the world collaborating, it was entirely shot and edited, and everyone goes, wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah, it does sound amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, there's, I'm just gonna throw some of the challenges at you now. The first one I'm gonna start with actually, the fourth one down. Was it just too out there? Was it a bit too right brain? Was it just a bit too much? And I think for most people, it was. Okay. It was certainly too much for, my, for many of my students who are essentially engineers with an engineering mindset. Um, you know, it's very, when you're working across disciplines, some projects are going to lend themselves to certain mindsets more than others. Um, this was a really challenging one. And um, the other thing that, and this is another thing that I don't need to tweet, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, they started kind of playing us off against one another and we couldn't work it out what was going on, but my students would say to me, well, we tried to have a hangout, but the students in New Zealand didn't turn up. But then the New Zealand tutor would say, well, my students told me that your students didn't. And it was like kids playing parents off against one another. And it was like, hang on a minute, this is becoming really quite hard um, to manage. So there was a lot of frustration there on the part of both us um, and the students. But yeah, it was challenging, and, you know, there were different semester dates, so we only really had three weeks where all the students were kind of in their teaching semester at once. That complicated things. Other things, other issues would be that for some students, it was kind of a core part of their degree. Marks really, you know, counted for this. For other students, it was extracurricular. For other students, it was an option in the module. You know, some very different drivers on behalf of the, on, you know, on the, part of the students. Um, yeah, and imbalanced student numbers as well. I mean, I had like 65 students. Um, there were only 10 in Colombia. 
20 in New Zealand. So immediately you can put them into teams, but each team has got kind of three UK students and one person from Colombia. You know, so there's all sorts of going on there in terms of power relations. So it was successful in some, you know, we, we had an end product. It was an exciting, um, wild, challenging project, but there were many issues. And another one of the issues as well was platform preferences. You know, we were always saying that we wanted to be really open and use open platforms. But when we looked at it, what we were doing really, you know, looking at asking yourself, you know, as Evelyn said this morning, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, you know, difficult questions. We were there thinking, isn't this great? We're using all these open platforms. But you know what? All we were doing was recreating a BLE. We had Dropbox for uploading files. We had Google Hangouts for this. We had Google Docs for this. We had the blogs for this. But essentially, it was just what you could do in any BLE except it was on open spaces. And really, when you're looking at something like this, it's kind of, mm, yeah, there are reasons. It means that one institution doesn't own it, but that doesn't get away from the problems of platform preferences, different platform preferences um, on the part of students and tutors, um, and which can be according to discipline, according to culture. You know, so for instance, the French students and tutor, they love to use LinkedIn and Behance, which is a video kind of portfolio network. Um, they're not so keen on Facebook. Um, the UK and New Zealand students love Facebook. They don't want to talk in a Google Doc. Um, New Zealand and Columbia students love Twitter. French students, UK students, not so keen. So it's all very well as saying, let's use all these open platforms, but everybody wants to use something different. So ultimately, whatever platforms you choose, gives somebody more power. Okay, so all of these things to kind of consider. So, you know, we had to ask ourselves some difficult questions. We knew that we were onto something good, but we knew that things kept working and other things wouldn't work. So it's like, okay, it's time for a new approach. So we had a rethink um, this year. Um, after working together virtually for three and a half years, I was actually lucky enough to finally get over to um, New Zealand for a couple of months at the end of the year and work face to face with um, Tom, Laurent and Dan and Max for the first time. And that's quite amazing when you've kind of worked with people for three and a half years and you've met on a weekly basis, you get to know one another so well. And one of the most lovely things was meeting together face to face and feeling like we knew one another. There were no surprises. It's amazing how well you can get to know people. I feel closer to these other than most of my you know, colleagues in the same university. Um, we see each other in we see each other either first thing in the morning or last thing at night because of the time zones. So you either look terrible or you've got a glass of wine in your hand. But either way, it's more intimate than an office situation. Um, so yeah, we know one another very well by now. We sat down. We had some very honest, very awkward chats and thought, well, how can we reimagine this? How can we make it work? So we kind of took in, you know took inspiration from small connectivist MOOCs um, in a sense and thought, well, let's just define it by a hashtag. And let's see what happens when we just build community around a hashtag and try and motivate people. That's it. So it's kind of very simple in that respect. Uh, we used a whole range of tools, YouTube, Vimeo, WordPress, Tagboard, Google, Google Hangouts, Plus, Docs, Facebook, Vine, Viclone, Instagram. The whole idea was that anyone could use whatever platform they wanted. Um, and as long as it was tagged with Moco 360, we could aggregate it all into one space and people could see the activity across multiple platforms. And then our job would then be to aggregate the activity and get learners infused enough to drive their own projects forward. We didn't want to dictate projects. We didn't want to organize it anymore. We just wanted to set this thing up and see what would happen. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about now. The first thing we did was thinking about this whole idea of the hello video, you know, sending hello, videos saying hello and having these go global hangouts where it's all quite stilted in a hangout window. Well, we've done that, and yes, it works, but it's not that interesting. I mean, that's the thing with the internet. It's all about making people want to click on something. And I think that's what we often do in education. You know, we, because of kind of educational logic, in a sense, aims, objective outcomes, we feel like we've got to give people everything so they know exactly what's going on. It's not really how digital cultures work, is it? You want to make people, you want people to want to click on something, to want to comment, to want to like, to want to share. You know, the two things are kind of very different in some respects. So what we did was we used Vine and we said to the students, right, okay, we want you to um, instead of doing these videos where you all say hello in your name and wave, can you all just start making weird videos and um, locating them <laughs> on Google Maps? 
and then you can all go on the Google Maps and play Google Stalking and you can all find each other and, uh, and it really worked because they found one another interesting because they were doing weird things. Um, so Vine was invaluable, you know, it's little six second videos. They loved making them and they were just much more interesting to one another. Okay, so that was the first thing we did. Um, it's interesting, actually, as the project's gone on, Vine has become a space in itself. Because of this six second restriction on a Vine video, it's led to this kind of digital resurgence of stop motion. And all of our students are going stop motion crazy and producing really, really, really good stuff. Um, so that's really nice to kind of see that and how it's become, as I say, a creative tool in itself. Here's an example now. This is a tag board, right? So this is pulling in content. This is content from Instagram, Vine, Twitter. It will pull in content from everywhere. So everybody can just follow that hashtag on the tag board and see it constantly moving and the contributions from all different platforms all around the world. So it's not about us dictating platforms at all anymore. Anyone can use anything. It's about learners and individual tutors choosing what platforms to use. So we're still seeing the community, but we're working across all of these different spaces. And um, there's a screenshot here just showing um, the way that we just planned our you know, collaborations or room spaces for collaboration this year. This is just a, a, a small part of a Google Doc. And what we did was we did put in what we'd be doing with our students in a particular week. And then we look to see where the potential would be for collaboration in that sense. So it wasn't about us saying, right, a project and making our courses fit. It was about, these are our courses, where would be a logical point to say to the students, hey, how about making a film with somebody in a different country? You know, there's subtle differences, but very, very effective. And um, another thing that, uh, with, with the tag board, and constantly pushing this hashtag, Moco360, students began to gradually get this sense of it as the modules went on. So if I think back to the first week of my module and I was telling the students about Moco 360, and it's just this alien thing to them, okay, but by starting each class each week, by pulling up the tag board and saying, look what's been happening this week, and they're spotting their content, and we're talking about content from other countries, it moves from being something alien to having this kind of ambient awareness of Moco 360, <laughs> and gradually builds up to a sense of them being part of something. And after about four to six weeks, they're really looking forward to collaborating with these other students whose work they've been seeing now for weeks and weeks. So just to, um, I mean, something that I thought was wonderful, as I said, people actually wanted to collaborate. It wasn't about us saying they had to do it anymore. It was completely up to them. But one of the students, when it got to the point where we kind of said, right, we're gonna set up a Facebook group but we're not going to be involved, this is just for you lot. If you want to talk, if you want to meet people from different countries to make a film with, there's a group there. Um, and they got really excited, and one of the students that week, he went home and um, made this video um, to sort of welcome all the students. This, is, this wasn't assessed. You know, there was just a real buzz about it. It's just a little stop motion. Colombia, Salut France, hey Kiwis, <laughs> from Salford, UK, UV, yeah, and it was really nice to see them kind of communicating in these ways through micro content, I think micro content is really powerful isn't it, you know it's fun to make, it's quick to make, it's easy to share, and again I think in the past we were trying to, without realising it we were kind of working along the lines of kind of old production paradigms, but in actual fact, these are much more effective ways to create, uh, connect in a networked age. So I'm gonna finish off just by um, showing you uh, three of the international collaborative projects that emerged, that were kind of driven by the learners, uh, because I think they all sort of demonstrate uh, different aspects of this kind of new form of the collaboration with Moco360. Um, the first one is, uh, it's a mixed reality mobile mentoring. Um, if this was, what I liked about this one is actually a, a collaboration between a student and a tutor. I mentioned before that in the first time we ever did an Elvis project, we were keen to get students and tutors kind of meeting together online. You know, we didn't want it to be us and them. 
Um, and this is a really nice example, as I say, of a student and tutor coming together. Very important in terms of behaviour modelling as well. Um, I'll just show you a short clip. So it's a mixed reality mobile mentory, um, looking at basically Bogota, Colombia, and Manchester, UK. So this is Philippe and Morgan. where we locate ourselves, similarities and differences between cultures. shout out and Morgan responded and they set up a Google Doc which was open to everyone to go and look at to see how they planned the shot, see how it was done and people learned from that but we were very very hands off but that then led to lots of students going on the Facebook group with ideas and it was just fantastic and I would sit there every day looking at the activity on this group going bloody hell, we've been trying to do this for three years now and it's been like forcing and as soon as we just back off and we're just enablers and get people excited you know they're doing some fantastic stuff here I mean this was this was within like not much time at all 38 comments and um, this student's film idea and people in all you know the different countries are going sounds great what would you like from me can you just please describe exactly what kind of shot you want where should the ball be how fast do you want me to spin you know and they're all talking um, and it was just fantastic to see that engagement. There's another lovely example here. Where this is a, a nice sort of crowdsourced example using Instagram clips of hands around the world. Again, using geolocation to get this sense of kind of space. Um, yeah. And looking at what different people's hands are doing around the world. So again, it's this idea of kind of laying micro content onto geo services. It's a really nice place to explore the technologies available to us, new cultural practices again. And they're, way, you know, they're looking at a way that we kind of see the world, the way that we can play with perception and perspective. 
So. year and do an entire week with next year's students, you know, they're going to actually run it. Um, it's been great to see how these things have taken off. I mean, last night, a, a tweet from a student, was it last night or this morning, saying, oh, I noticed we haven't got a Vimeo group for, um, the, for the module, so I've just set one up, so you can just tell everyone. And, you know, they're really kind of, it's, it's, it's for them, it's, it's theirs as well, I guess that's what I'm saying. And I think micro formats, you know, the Vines, the Instagram, it's easy to dismiss them. Um, as something that's kind of quite frivolous because they're easy to do and easy to share but actually they're fantastic they give us a fantastic constraint which is time and having to do something in a short space of time means that the students this year have experimented with so many different filming techniques because they can do it within 6 seconds or 15 seconds or 30 seconds and so by the time they come to the collaborations they've already experimented with techniques and they're just dying to sort of you know, test drive them with other people so some really interesting sort of dynamic shifts there, and as I say, it's worked very well. Um, so I think, as I say, it's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect. Um, I'd like to, you know, next year carry on with this, but bring in more time for kind of in-depth reflections at the end. That's always going to be a challenge because of time and different semester dates. <coughs> but you know, it's always going to be a work in progress because we're constantly learning by this. But one of the things that I think you know we've really taken from this this year was just, you know, embrace the chaos, stop trying to control it, because I think that's the mistake we've made over the last two years. We've tried to really keep these things tight and organised and all the things that we think we should do. Um, it's interesting, Evelyn was, you know, saying this morning about, um, you know, Tom Bennett's book, and, you know, and I, I'm an educational researcher myself, I, I, I'm, I love a bit of educational theory, but if I'm brutally honest, um, I'm also inclined to trust my instinct. And I can see when something's good or something's not good. Okay, the last couple of years in these collaborations, the final products, you watch them and you assess them. You don't want to watch those films again. Put it that way, they don't have to be there. Um, <laughs> but this year, um, I'm taking, I'm, I mean, I'm, it's a joyous experience watching the films that the students are making and watching them again and again. We had a film showing um, on Tuesday afternoon where we got um, one of the, you know, a, sort of an hour-long showreel of group projects they've done, and we all sat down and watched these films. It's brilliant. And some of the films I've watched again and again and again, I love them. When you can love your students' work, when they can love their work, when they want to do more and they want to share, then you just know that it's right, you know. So I think we need to keep hold of that, 
bring a bit more in-depth reflection next year, see how it goes. I'm sure something else will go wrong, but um, there you go. So I'd just like to end by thanking my wonderful team, because they are fantastic to work with, and uh, I think we're really lucky to have found one another. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you.